one of the very few you will ever meet, probably. <laughs> Apart from that, I like making stuff. You might have used some of my work. It's all on GitHub. Uh, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. Uh, my day job is doing research at MIT uh, in HCI, which is the fancy academic term for usability. Uh, and as uh, Claudina said, I've written a book. You should totally buy it. Shameless plug there. Oh, okay. Now I can see my screen, though. Okay. Hopefully you can hear me better now. Uh, so, on to CSS variables. So the first ever CSS variable actually came way before the CSS variable spec, and it was called cust a current caller. It came from SVG. Uh, it's been supported in browsers for a very long time, even i9. And the way it works is it automatically gets the value of the color property. So if I change my color property here, not only the text color updates, but my gradient as well, because I've used current color here. So CSS variables are kind of like current color on steroids. They allow us to extend this concept to pretty much anything we want. So let's specify a color variable here. Uh, so CSS variables are declared with this weird dash dash syntax. Um, they're, essentially they're essentially custom properties. They work exactly the same way as any other CSS property. Uh, the dash dash comes from, so many people ask me, why didn't we use a dollar or something like that? Uh, the reason we didn't use a dollar is that we want people to be able to use both SAS variables, like preprocessor variables, and CSS variables. They, they do different things. Uh, they accomplish different goals. There are things you can do with CSS variables that you absolutely cannot do with SAS. And there are things you can do with SAS variables that you cannot do with CSS variables. So we want people to be able to use both of them on the same style sheet. So you can imagine dash, the dash dash syntax as like a prefix property with an empty prefix. You know how we have like WebKit dash properties? So CSS variables are like properties with an empty prefix. So you call them, you call their value but with the var function. And I can use that everywhere. Almost everywhere, you cannot use that in selectors. You cannot do, use that in property names, only in property values. And you cannot use it in the query part of a media query. But you can use them pretty much in every property value with very few exceptions that I will discuss soon. Uh, so as you can see now, if I change the value of the dash dash color property, it changes everywhere. You might not be very impressed because you might be thinking, well, I can do the same thing with current color and it's supported in more browsers. The thing is with, col with, with CSS variables, we can do way more things than just colors. So let's say I want to parameterize the size of these corners with another variable called corners. And then I go here, and instead of 90%, uh, I say 100% minus the value of this variable, which I have to call with the corners property. Uh, sorry, the var function. I always make this mistake. I just type the name of the property because it's kind of what I'm used from SAS, but you have to remember to use the, the var function to call it. So now I've created my custom property, and I can change the size of the, corner, of the corners by just adjusting the corners property. And you might still not be very impressed, because you, you might be like, OK, that was just one place in your style sheet. Why not just go there and specify 20 pixels right in the color stop? So the thing is, just because CSS variables work just like any other CSS property, you can use them everywhere, uh, for even on inline styles. and it still works just the same. So the first takeaway from this talk is that the CSS variables work exactly like normal CSS properties. The actual name for the spec is called um, it, 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 custom properties, not CSS variables. And another thing to keep in mind is that they inherit. So here I have a simple structure of three divs, which, and each of them contains another div. And I have applied, I have said that on every div on this page, I want the outline property to take its value from the outline variable. And then on block one, which is this first white div, I've specified that dash dash outline is equal to this outline, 0.2m solid. But you can see that the inner div also gets the same outline because the first declaration applies to it and it gets the dash dash outline value from its parent. 
Of course, I can target it explicitly if I want. Um, but by default, all CSS variables inherit. I can specify, uh, I can cancel this inheritance by using the universal selector and giving it a value of initial. And as you can see, this cancels inheritance. I can still target it specifically. Um, and of course, I can use the inherit keyword if I do want it to inherit. So like this, sorry, inherit, not initial. So then I can explicitly make it inherit where I actually want it to inherit, but by default it, I've made it so that it doesn't inherit anymore. And the, the way this works is that this takes advantage of the fact that CSS properties applied directly on an element have higher precedence than values being inherited. And the universal selector applies to every element directly, and yes, it has a specificity of zero, but it still has higher precedence than values that have been inherited. So the second takeaway is that CSS variables are inherited properties, not just, they don't just work like any property, they're also inherited. But you can change that with the trick we saw. So a third thing is, uh, so here we're using uh, this, this sad.jpg background in a folder called, in an image folder, which has other images presumably. So it's a reasonable thing to think about that, why not make a variable with the name of the file and then build the URL here so that I can change the name of the file without having to type the, the, whole, the whole path. However, as you can see, this doesn't really work. So my second, my second thought might be, hmm, okay, I can try to put the entire path in there. It's not great, but maybe that will work. Let's try it out. So as you can see, this doesn't work either. And last attempt, we might think, let's put the URL function in there as well. At this point, the variable doesn't even help us very much, but we're just experimenting. So let's see, does that work? Nope. This doesn't work either. However, this is a Chrome bug. It works in Firefox. This, <laughs> this, version, this version should work. The previous versions do not work. And that's, because, and that's due to a bug in CSS. That's not due to a bug in the browser. It's due to a bug in CSS. The reason is that the URL function has very weird pars parsing rules uh, because it can be used with both a, a, an unquoted URL and a quoted URL. So the URL function is the only place where variables do not work. In any other function, as we've shown earlier, for in the, uh, earlier we saw in the radial gradient function, variables work just fine. In the URL function, nope. In the future, uh, we're talking about adding like an alias, uh, a function that works exactly the same as URL but has a different name and you can use variables in it. And the concat function or a way to concatenate so that you can concatenate different parts and slowly build up uh, a URL or an SVG path or a ton of other things. But right now, nope. By the way, this is kind of funny. So in Chrome that has this weird bug, the bug is not with URLs in general. The bug is with relative URLs. If I specify an absolute URL, Suddenly it starts working. I don't know. So the takeaway <laughs> is CSS variables plus URL equals chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Some more WTFs because CSS after all. So dash dash foo uh, with an empty value is invalid. That is not quite surprising. If I ask you how many do you think this is invalid, you would probably all raise your hands, right? The WTF is that this is valid. <laughs> and the value of the variable here is an empty space. A space, I mean, all spaces are empty. <laughs> also, unlike any other CSS property, variables are case sensitive. Eh. So you can provide fallbacks uh, to variables 
by using the second argument of the var function. So it actually supports a second argument. And you might be wondering, but I can provide fallbacks in CSS by just using a, a normal declaration before it, like I've done here with the red color. The thing is, these two fallbacks work a bit differently. So as you can imagine, and you have to use both of them. As you can imagine, uh, if, if variables are not supported, this code snippet would produce a background of red. That's pretty normal. The var function is an, it would be considered invalid. The browser would be like, hey, I don't understand this. It would throw away the whole declaration. Um, the, the, the place where the orange becomes useful is when a browser supports variables, but there's no accent color set. So if, if, there's, if accent color has not been set, then it, would, it will use orange. If, if accent color is set to yellow green, it will use yellow green. Of course, that's not surprising. Now, what will happen if accent color is set to something that doesn't make sense in background, like five or something? How many think orange? How many think red? It's actually transparent. <laughs> it goes to the initial value. Um, so these fallbacks can be daisy chained. So you can have color one whose fallback, if there is no color one set, is the value of color two, whose fallback is the value of color three, whose fallback is red. You can daisy chain them as much as you want. Also, you can combine variables with the at supports rule and apply completely different CSS depending on whether variables are supported or not, which could be useful in some cases. So in this case, if variables are not supported, then this entire rule will, become, will, will not be applied. Uh, you can also apply specific CSS to browsers that don't support CSS variables by using the not operator. Obviously, they need to support at supports as well. So I'm, I'm sure many of you at this point, and probably earlier on, uh, will be thinking, OK, these variables are nice and all that, but won't someone please think of browser support? Like, surely these things are not supported everywhere, anywhere yet, right? Maybe, even, maybe just Chrome? How many of you had thoughts about browser support while I was explaining variables? Yeah, most of you. So you might be surprised to find that actually CSS variables are supported everywhere. <laughs> with one small exception. And to be fair to Edge, uh, because they've actually changed their ways and they're now putting a lot of effort into supporting standards. They're putting a lot of resources into it. So they have announced that they're working on it. It's in development, and 99% it will be on the next version of Edge. So that's good news. Something that will trip up people coming from the SaaS world is that they're used, to, they're used to using variables everywhere, and it doesn't matter. You can use them in selectors. You can use them in property values. You can use them in, uh, I don't know, everywhere. You can concatenate them with other things and slowly build, out, build your CSS because uh, the, the SAS compiler just spits out CSS and that's sent to the browser and the browser never even knew what variables he had. However, that's not quite true with CSS variables, mostly for the better because they're very dynamic, but there are a few gotchas here. So let's say in this case, so we, had, we have this div uh, whose width and height are 8 ms and we specified that so we can size it based on the font size and it scales as long as our font size does. But what if we want to change the proportion of the sides uh, and the font size? So we want to reduce the size com relative to the font size. So as you can see, I'm, ch I'm making every change twice, which is not good. It's, uh, it's, it's against dry coding. You should try to write your CSS in such a way that you can change things in one place. Otherwise, they're bound to get out of sync eventually, especially as more and more people work on the code base. So we had the idea that, OK, we're going to make a variable, and we might be trying to take dry to its absolute extreme and say, yeah, I don't want to repeat m either, so I'm just going to use 6. And this is something that is very common in SAS. But if we try to do this in CSS, as you can see, it's just not working. It's exactly the same as if we haven't specified a width and height at all. 
And the reason is that this is invalid because these variable values are not seen as just random strings. They cannot be anything. There's, this is seen as a number. It's the number six. The browser knows it's the number six. And if, when, you, when you try to put it next to the M, it doesn't see a length. It doesn't see 6M. It sees a number next to, a, to an identifier. And it doesn't even know what the M identifier is. So it's just, and how to deal with all this? How do you deal with a value that is a number and an identifier? Basically, the browser sees this as equivalent to this. So it doesn't know how to deal with it, and it just throws it away. Of course, you can put M's here, and then it will just work. And if you want, to have six as well, because you might want to use it in another place too, you can specify a second variable, let's say side. And then, if you have six here, you can convert it to m's with calc. So you call your variable inside calc, and then you multiply it by one m. And let's change the variable we're referring to here. And as you can see, this works. And I can change it here, and it just works. And if I want to use the six in another place where I don't need amps, but I need something else, it will work. So you might be wondering now, OK, why do this? Why not just specify six amps? And even if I, if I need it somewhere else, I can just divide it by one m instead of multiplying it by one m. However, you cannot divide by lengths. You can only divide by numbers. Calc is actually invalid if you try to do something like this. So even though you can convert from a number to a unit by using calc, you cannot convert from a unit to a number. If you have like, something like 10 pixels, you cannot convert it to 10 in, with, with CSS. There's just no way to do that right now. There probably will be in the future, but right now there's no way you can do this. So it's always better to use variables for pure data, not just CSS values, uh, not CSS values, uh, unless you're like absolutely 100% sure that you will only need it, that you will only need this variable as a length, then you, then then set it to a number because you can do anything with a number, but you cannot do anything with a length. And even in cases where I thought I would only need a length, eventually it turned out that actually I didn't. Uh, so it's it's always better to plan ahead and use and, and set variables only to pure data and only to numbers. So how many of you have worked with CSS animations? Not necessarily at work, if, if, you, if it's exper if personal experimenting, that counts too. OK, most of you, great. So I think many of you might be wondering right now, OK, CSS variables are cool, but you know what's even cooler? Animating them. And I agree, but there are some problems with that, because CSS. So let's say, instead of animating background color, I wanted to set background color to a variable, say BG, and let's test that this works by setting BG to orange. And we need to cancel the animation first. Yeah, that works. Okay, so let's go inside our animation and change these to be animating BG instead of background color. Fail. As you can see, this doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is both a limitation of CSS variables and the browser bug, working together to make us pull our hair out. The spec reason is that, this is a quote from the spec, CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, yay, but since the UA has no way to interpret their contents, they always use the flips at 50% behavior that is used for any other pair of values that cannot be intelligently interpolated. So what this means is because the browser doesn't know exactly what type these variables are, or at least it pretends to not know because they're tokens, so they sh it should know. But anyway, um, the browser pretends that it doesn't know what type they are, so it doesn't know how to interpolate them. So what should be happening here is that it should be flipping from yellow to turquoise without any transition. The part that Chrome is dropping these completely, that's a browser bug. So yeah, CSS variables and animations equals chocolate ice cream. There is some hope, A, in the future, we'll be able to set what type 
our variables are. Uh, for example, this is the syntax, it's JavaScript. We'll be able to use this to, to say, for example, this custom property is a color and its initial value is black. Why do you have to use JavaScript to set the type of a custom property that you defined in your CSS to use it in a CSS animation in your CSS? That is beyond me. There is some hope. Um, so you cannot animate these custom properties, but you can use var references in animations. So let's say you have color one, which is yellow, and color two, which is turquoise. And inside here, we don't need this anymore. I want to say, animate background color from color one to color two. And that will actually work, as you can see. So it's only that you cannot animate the actual variables, but you can use their values in animations. Also, transitions uh, kind of work. Not exactly, I will explain. So in this case, I have this slide, and when I'm clicking on it, it switches to turquoise. You can see the code here, just changing the background from yellow to turquoise. And I have a transition, so it transitions smoothly. So if I did the same thing and I was trying to animate a variable, to transition a variable, and let's say background is BG. So you can see that now this happens smoothly. Even though what I'm changing when I'm clicking on the, what, what I'm changing when I click on the slide is the variable, not background. So why, why is this happening? Does it mean I can transition variables but I can't animate them? That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So this tripped me up at first and I actually tweeted uh, huh, you can animate, uh, you cannot animate variables, but you can transition them. And then Tab replied to me, who is the editor of the spec, and he, he was like, actually, what is happening there is not that BG is animated, is being transitioned, it's that background is being transitioned as a result of BG changing. So if I restrict my transition here to BG, it doesn't work. There is no transition, because the transition doesn't actually happen on BG. It happens on background. But still, there's hope. So let's go to some uh, more uh, frequently encountered use cases. I will not mention any use cases of things you can do with SAS variables as well, uh, because I don't think they're particularly interesting. Yeah, you can, you can set your main fonts on a root, and then you can use them throughout your style sheets just like you can do with SAS. You can set your main colors on root, and then you can use them throughout your style sheet just like with SAS. But I think the most interesting use cases are the things you cannot really do with SAS. So, or less, I don't discriminate. Or any other preprocessor. Let's just assume that when I say SAS, I mean any preprocessor. So a very common case is having components with their own styling and then creating variations of them. This is a very, very simple component, just a button. You can imagine how the same thing extrapolates to way more complex components. So I have uh, my, my base styling, which uses a black uh, text color and a black border. And when I hover over it, it changes to a black background and a white color. So. The the, I have the same color for the text and the border and then for the background on hover. And everything else stays the same in the two variations. So I have a pink variation here, but I had to create it explicitly. I had to add, a, I had to support a pink class in my CSS and basically repeat most of the CSS to override the colors I set in the base class. So how do variables simplify this? So variables simplify this in, in two ways. Let's say uh, I set a, a color variable and I set it to black. 
and then I use it here, and I use it here, and I use it here. And then I can create a variation just by setting the value of the variable. I can get rid of this entire rule. I only need one line of CSS to create a theme for my component. And it works exactly the same way. I can even get rid of this class and specify it inline, like say color blue. And now I created the blue component. I don't, I don't need to have predefined variations anymore. I have infinite variations suddenly. Well, near infinite. If there are any mathematicians in the room, they would kind of be annoyed if I said infinite. And another good thing is not just that it reduces code, it's also that it lets you style components without having to care about their uh, internal styling. I don't have to care whether the hover effect is done with a background or some other way. Uh, let's say I wanted, instead of a background on hover, to do it with a box shadow, an inset box shadow. Ah, and I need to add a transition. And you can see the effect, and I changed this effect without a, uh, affecting anyone's code that is using my component and theming my component. People can still use exactly the same code to set the color of the component they're using without having to care whether I'm using a box shadow or a background. So you've seen, uh, I'm using a pattern here, I'm setting dash dash color to black and then overriding it. This is kind of flimsy because it means that people th theming my component need to use higher specificity than, uh, than what I have in my component. The, the proper way to do this is to not, uh, to not have a color declaration at all and then provide a fallback here. as we've shown in the second argument. So this works exactly the same way, except people don't have to care about the specificity of the of, of their rule to be able to theme my component. And you might be thinking, so variables are all about reducing code, but this is a lot of repetition. I have to repeat this fallback in a ton of places. So you can set a variable with it. Um, or my favorite solution is what I call default default values. CC uh, copyright Lia Veru, default default values, let's make this a thing. Um, so let's define another, another variable with, that actually calls color and gives it its default value. And then inside, in, in the rest of my code, I just use that variable and not the actual user variable. Did I do it everywhere? Yep, and you can see it still works the same. And, I, and now we can change the fallback in uh, one place. Now the fallback is Rebecca Purple. So the six takeaway CSS variables enable theming completely independent of CSS structure. People theming your component don't need to know how you wrote your CSS, which I think is very important for sharing components. And default default values are possible by using another variable and just not exposing it. Like, people don't have to know that, I'm, that, that I have a call variable here. You, I just tell them, if you want this, to theme this component, you use dash dash caller. Unless they, if, unless they read my CSS, they don't even know that dash dash caller exi call exists. And if they read my CSS, well, they're free to do whatever they want anyway. Another big use case for variables is responsive design. Instead of having to put code inside media queries, you can just set a variable. Um, so in here, I don't have to specify a different margin depending on the width of uh, my window. I just, uh, I just set the gutter variable and I can use the gutter variable everywhere in my CSS. So let's try to get off, sc off full screen and see how this works. You can see that now that I've reduced the size of my window, I'm getting the smaller gutter size. And this is not a particularly fancy example because it's just one place, but you can use, as you, as you know in layouts, you use this gutter size in many places. 
So CSS variables make responsive design much easier. And these are some of the basic, like, um, cool case, uh, interesting use cases that variables were made for. But there are also some more interesting, cooler use cases uh, that I wanted to show. So uh, if you take advantage of the trick I described earlier about canceling inheritance, you can basically create your own custom properties that set multiple other properties at once. So here, because until very recently you needed, and still probably for Safari, you needed the WebKit prefix to use clip path. Inst uh, instead of having to use like auto prefixer or prefix free or something like that, uh, I defined the CSS variable. And now I can use dash dash clip path instead of having to, to use two versions of the same property. And because I've defined that on every element it's initial, unless I actually explicitly set it, then both WebKit clip path and clip path will be set to their own initial values, which is no clipping. Unless I, of course, use them explicitly, so it's not like it breaks any existing code. Um, so let me try to demonstrate this. It's kind of hard to write clip paths on stage, but I will try. And if I if it fails, please don't judge me. <laughs> so we're trying to do a diamond. Okay, that seems to be working. Uh, and then zero and fifty percent. Okay, that worked. Thank you. I always worry I will like screw this up every time I'm writing a polygon. Um, so as you can see, it doesn't inherit. Uh, it's not. It, it like many people when they see this this trick, they're like, but but clip path will inherit in the, into the children. No, it doesn't because we have that clip path in initial in the universal selector. That's the trick. If we didn't, then yes, it would inherit. So, and we can apply this to anything. As you can see, uh, clip paths everywhere. So we can basically use dash dash clip path as an alias, and when eventually we stop needing WebKit anymore, we just remove that declaration. We, we just remove this. So CSS variables enable you to set multiple properties at once. That's it. I think is pretty cool. Another cool use case is that you can make your own properties that are shorthands, shortcuts to other properties with some values pre-filled. So let's say I'm using a lot of purple shadows for some reason. Like let's say I really like purple shadows. Don't don't wonder why. Just just go with it. So I'm using the same trick here to cancel inheritance. And then I'm defining that box shadow is the value of purple shadow plus Rebecca purple. And this is not causing a box shadow on every element because you cannot have a box shadow that is just Rebecca purple. You need to provide at least an, a, an X and Y offset. So if I'm, not, if I'm not setting purple shadow, then box shadow computes to its, or, to, to its initial value and no shadow gets generated. So here, I can, I can just use the purple shadow property and customize the offsets. Um, as you can see, and make it an even more horrible shadow. And I can use purple shadow in a ton of places without having to repeat the color anywhere. Can even provide a spread radius. Or make it inset. So, 10th takeaway, CSS variables enable you to create property shortcuts with values pre-filled in. What programmers would call function carrying in a way. Uh, function carrying is what lets you create a function with some of the arguments already filled in. So, another cool use case is how you can create your own short, uh, long hands with CSS variables. So this is a, a, a bit too much code for a slide, but it's actually pretty repetitive. I'm defining six CSS variables, uh, one for every aspect of box shadow, and then I'm setting box shadow to all of them concatenated, and I'm specifying default values for all of them except blur. An interesting case is, is the last one. Note that its default value is a space. That is perfectly valid. Because 
you either have the insert keyword or you don't. So what would you set the inset's default value to? Because by default, they're not inset. So you can set it to a space. And then I can use box shadow blur, for example, and set it to 10 pixels. And box shadow color, set it to Rebecca purple. And so on. And say I want to set it to a different color when I hover. Actually, let's set the offset so that it's a more visible shadow. It will look horrible, but, or the spread. Yeah, that's more visible. Yes, it looks horrible, I know, but it will be more visible. And now let's say on hover, come on. Ah. On hover, I want to set the color to something else, like red. And as you can see, this works. I don't have to repeat any of the other properties. So essentially, we took a property that takes a lot of values and it's not a shorthand, and we created our own longhands for it. So CSS variables enable you to create custom longhands. That's something to remember. And lastly, CSS variables allow you to create your own entirely custom properties in, in, in some ways. Let's say I, I kind of always wanted to have a prepend property that lets you prepend some text without having to write a CSS rule. Uh, so you can do it inline, you can do it yeah, anywhere without having an extra rule. So with CSS variables, you can do that. As long as you have uh, a universal rule that sets that property to initial, again, to cancel inheritance. And then the, um, the before pseudo element on every element, there is an implied asterisk here that I didn't have to write, but it's implied. And it sets the content property to prepend. And you might be wondering, doesn't this generate pseudo element boxes for every element? Isn't that kind of horrible? Actually, it doesn't, because if you haven't set the prepend uh, property to a value, then it computes to its, to its initial value, which is none. So it doesn't generate a, a pseudo element box. So we can use it like this. You can use it to the, on the inline element, on the descendant element. You can use it on every element. <laughs> Everywhere you want. And even better, you can use it in line as well. Let's say that seems a good place. Anywhere. So uh, I thought that was quite interesting. So CSS variables enable you to define your own properties. So SVG variables can also be used in SVG, not just HTML. And you can do many cool things with that. So here we have two eyes. Here's the SVG for them. It's a lot, it's a bit much, but you don't have to really process it. Uh, basically, these are the eye whites. Um, and these are the irises. The blue and black are just a stroke and a fill, uh, a blue stroke and a black fill. And I'm also using the eye white path on a clip path so that the iris is actually clipped by the eye because it would be very creepy if the iris was like overflowing the eye. <laughs> and here, I'm setting the, the horizontal center value of the iris. Remember, these are the elements that have the iris class. Here, class equals iris. And also here, class equals iris. So then I can change this, and it looks to different places. Do you feel watched right now? And let's see, it's, uh, it's 75 pixels to get, to, to get it to look this way, or actually that way on the projection. It's this way on my laptop, that's weird. Uh, and it's 25 pixels to get it to look this way. 
So I kind of want to set where it looks without having to care about the, how the SVG is drawn. So I can set a look variable, which is, which goes from zero to one, let's say it has default, uh, let's set it to 0.5 for now or something, or 0.2 or something. And then we have a calc. Remember, it's 25 to 75 pixels. By the way, these are not real pixels. These are, these are um, based on the coordinate system of the SVG, which is defined here in the view box. So I can scale it, and the meaning of those pixels changes. It's relative to the SVG. And in the SVG itself, I can just say 25. I don't have to say 25 pixels, because it doesn't really make sense that it's pixels. But Chrome is a bit buggy if I don't use, um, if I don't use the, the, the pixel unit. Like, I can set it to 20, but I cannot do calc 25 and 50. It just doesn't work for some reason. If I specify pixels here, it works. I think that's a bit odd, but I've learned to live with these bugs. And then I can call look here. And now I can change this. And that's all I need to know. I don't need to, to care whether it's 25 pixels or 30 pixels or 150 pixels. I just change a look variable that, de that defines whether it's looking left or right. You can also um, combine CSS variables with JavaScript. And that's actually some, th those are actually some of the most interesting cases. How many of you uh, do write JavaScript or, or do know some JavaScript? Okay, great, great. Um, I'll keep it vanilla and it's only like a few lines on each example. So hopefully it shouldn't be too overwhelming. So first off, to get a variable from the inline style of an element, you use element.style.getPropertyValue. value. It's exactly the same syntax that you use for any other property, actually, except we don't use it very much for any other property because we have a nicer syntax. Like we don't say element.style get property value font size. We just say element.style dot font size in camel case. But because CSS variables don't really have a camel case version, we have to use this generic function. Uh, also, this will only take the value from the inline style. You have to use get computed style instead if you want to get the value regardless of whether it's inherited, whether it's set in the style sheet, whether it's set in line. That covers all, use, all these use cases, all these cases. And to set it, you use element.style.set property, and that sets it in line, but you don't usually care. That's usually fine. Uh, and some of you might be wondering why is it get property value but set property? Why is it like get property? I don't know. It's another API design mistake of the CSS OM, of which there are many. So the first example I want to show you ha has to do with uh, writing CSS that varies depending on mouse movement, which is something all of us had to do at some point, or mo many of us. Uh, and usually, the way you do it is you set the CSS in the JavaScript, um, and you generate it there. So with CSS variables, you don't have to write any actual CSS in your JavaScript except setting these variables. Like here, I have a mouse move uh, event listener on the document, um, and I'm setting two variables, mouse x and mouse y, uh, on uh, the, whose values are the, per uh, the percentage of how much the, the, my cursor is moved horizontally and vertically. And why, and, and it's a number from zero to one. And why is, why is that the case? Why do I not set them to pixels? Because if they're numbers like this, I can convert them to pixels, but I can't do the other, uh, I can't do the opposite. And if, if I want to convert them to like measurements based on the viewport, I can always multiply them by 100VH or 100VW. So here I have a radial gradient. It's, it's center, it's fixed at the center, and I want its center to vary depending on my mouse movement. So. I use calc and 100% multiplied by var mouse x. And you can see now it moves horizontally based on my mouse pointer. And I can do the same with the y coordinate. And now it moves based on my mouse pointer. And I can, I can change the CSS without if it's different people writing the JavaScript and different people writing the CSS, 
I don't have to go and contact the developer if I want to change the CSS and say, hey, actually, I decided that the color stop would be like closer together, and please change this. Um, sorry. And the developer's like, you always change things. I am so fed up with you. Can you just please learn some JavaScript and do it yourself? No more friction like this anymore. You tell the developer to set your CSS variables, you use your CSS variables and your CSS to do exactly what you want, and you can change it and tweak it as often as you want without having to bother anybody. It's actually, I think CSS variables are kind of the answer to all these React people saying that you should put CSS in JavaScript because then you can, uh, you can have computed CSS and you can vary your CSS based on JavaScript things. Actually, you don't. You just set a variable, and then you, use, you put your styling where it belongs in the CSS. Thank you. <laughs> and remember our SVG demo? So what if I wanted these eyes to actually move based on my mouse? I could define, I could actually use mouse x here. I think I don't have to do any calculations, right? Yep, I can just use mouse x here. I can even remove this. And they just work. I didn't have to set another variable for this. I can just reuse the mouse X I already have. I can just use this one event listener and set this variable on the root element and then I can use it in anything that varies based on the mouse. These are completely different demos and I, I, both of them work with exactly the same variable. So, there. Um, also, another thing I often wanted was to be able to access a value of an input in, Java, in uh, CSS. Uh, and sadly, you can't. But if you write a little bit of JavaScript, you can set a value uh, variable on the input. Uh, so here, we're going over all the inputs in the page and we're setting uh, a variable of value on them. And also, we're setting an event listener on the document for the input event. And then we're, setting the, we're resetting the value on the input. This is generic. This will work even if you add more inputs, even if some script adds more inputs on your page because it's using event delegation. So now, I have a slider here. It's, uh, I have already applied appearance known to it so that it doesn't have the default value, uh, the default look. And I wanted this gradient to move. Let's apply a border. I don't like how this looks. Okay, eh. Anyway, I'm not gonna be tweaking design now. Um, so I wanted this gradient to move with the slider. Right now it's fixed at 50%, uh, but I can use calc and use the, uh, the, the value variable. And the value variable goes from zero to 100, so I need to multiply it by 1%. And as you can see, now it works. Now it changes based on the value. It looks kind of horrible, but that was the simplest demo I could come up with. Anything else would have like a lot of CSS properties just for styling, and I didn't want to clutter the actual the demo. Another, an effect I talked about in some of my talks a few years ago was um, doing a typing effect, a typing simulation with uh, with CSS, so how you could use animations for that. Um, so the main idea was you had two animations, one for, for emulating the carrot, uh, which made it blink from a border color of transparent to a border color of, the, of current color, which is the default for borders. Um, and you can see how this works um, on the carrot. It's already applied, because it's kind of unrelated to this demo. And the actual typing was done by animating width from zero to the number of characters you had with the CH unit. And because this is a monospace font, the CH unit, is, which is the width of the zero character, actually corresponds to the width of every character. So let's try to, to show how this works. At this point, there, no variables are in this demo uh, yet. Uh, so let's try to animate from zero to the current width. I'm applying the typing animation. The two keyframe is automatically computed by the current state, and let's say 10 seconds. And now, if I apply it and unapply it, if I apply it again, you can see that it doesn't quite work yet. 
because we need the steps timing function, and we need to, to set that to the number of characters as well. So now it works. However, it's not very maintainable. You can do it for like the heading of, the, of each page, but you have to do it individually. Uh, and you can still you can set it with an inline style, but it's really messy. Um, so the good thing is that with JavaScript, you can go all of, over all these elements that have a class of typing, and you can set a CSS variable of length to the length of their contents. And now, I can I can use that variable here to make this effect work regardless of how many characters my heading has, or my paragraph in this case. So here, uh, OK. And now you might be thinking, this looks exactly the same as before. How do I know you're not like messing with us? So let's change the text to CSS variables all and apply it again. And you can see that. That's a bit too slow, but it works. And the reason it's slower, it seems slower than before, is because the duration is 10 seconds regardless of how many characters I have. So I need to also vary the duration. So I use calc again with length, and I multiply it by the, num the, the duration I want for every keystroke. Let's say 0.2 seconds, because I'm kind of running late. So you can see that. Now it works, regardless of how much text I have. I can even reduce it to CSS. And if I apply it again, the keystroke, every keystroke has the same duration. Whoops. And last demo, because I'm running late, um, is so it's pretty popular these days to, to vary CSS depending on the scroll position of, of either the whole page or a specific element. And you can do that with CSS variables as well. So here I'm getting all these, I'm getting all the elements with a class of scrolling. I'm adding an event, a scroll event listener on them. And every time they're scrolled, I'm calculating what's the maximum scroll. Um, it's, the, it's the whole height of the content minus the height of the element. And then I'm calculating how, how much are they scrolled compared to the maximum scroll so that I get a number again from zero to one. And then I can do a lot of things with that number. So, and I'm setting that, uh, I'm setting a CSS variable or with, of scroll to that value. So now I have a gradient here that is hard coded to 20%, regardless of how I scroll. So I'm gonna use my trusty calc and multiply 100% by the value of scroll. And now, as I'm scrolling, the gradient varies. And just like all the other demos, I can change the presentation without having to do anything with the JavaScript. If I want, instead of this, uh, instead of this kind of gradient, to have a progress bar at the top, and I want to set like background size to something like this, and I want to make this red, and I want to make the background not transparent but white, I can do that. No need to change the JavaScript. No need to bother any developer if I'm not writing my JavaScript. It just works. So I think CSS variables are a revolution for separation of style and behavior. And they're coming at exactly the right time, at exactly the time that there is all this about let's move all our CSS to the JavaScript and let's move all our HTML to the JavaScript and let's move everything to the JavaScript and let's just have JavaScript like consume the entire web and everything. <laughs> So there are an answer to that. Uh, these are the, the specs. Um, the first one is the stable spec. The, last, the second one is the, the editor's draft, which is like the most updated one. And one last thing, very, very quickly. Uh, so CSS variables are the, the present, not the future. What is the future? There are many discussions about um, custom app rules, custom functions, all sorts of things. One thing that is a bit more near future than the others is the at apply rule, because it's already supported in Chrome behind the flag, but still, uh, which lets you do native mix-ins. So for example, I can have like a border uh, here, 
like I have two declarations and I'm saying at apply this dash dash pg and dash dash pg is a set of declarations now and I'm applying all of them uh, by using the at apply rule. Uh, sadly, if I use a variable in here, let's say foo, you would expect that this would work, right? And you would get a, a red background so you could have mix-ins with parameters. Sadly, it doesn't work. What works is if I, well, if I put foo here, so variables are resolved based on the defining scope and not the calling scope, which I think is very unfortunate. Thankfully, this is pretty early stage, so maybe it will change in the future. I don't know. Anyway, that's all I had for you today. Thank you very much. That's how we end the conference. Woo, great talk. Um, Leah, we, uh, I won't even worry about sitting down over there because we're, we are short on time, but I do have one question that came up. What are the, uh, what's like the performance implications of handling CSS variables in JavaScript and have you done any like performance work So I haven't, this? I haven't measured performance, but I've been using them extensively and I haven't noticed uh, any slowdown or anything. So pretty, pretty performant. Yep. yep. At a, are you using them at like a, at a mass sort of scale of completely like rewriting all of your code where you're, for your components and, and doing it in this way? Or are you using it just in smaller examples? Uh, mostly smaller things. I'm kind of dipping my toes in it uh, for now. Do you have any projects that, down the line that might be bigger that, are, that you're working on? Yeah? Yep, but I can't exciting. talk about that yet. Ah, well, exciting. Good. <laughs> well, we look forward to that. Thank you so much. Great talk. Thank um, you. Huge round of applause.